kid. Seriously. Welcome to a leggy return of the Star Wars In Review podcast. We are the only podcast that really does have something for that ship, and trust us, it is mutual. Over there, it's Luke Neitzel, whose exploits, modest mouse notwithstanding, have been well documented. And over here, it's Maya Madrid, who is a lover, not a fighter. Every so often, we get together to discuss news in the realm of Star Wars, answer some questions that kids seriously got, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Luke Neitzel, how are you? I'm... Distracted by why your shorts are so short. When you get low on clean clothing, sometimes you just have to make do with what... They're not that short. But why are your shorts so short? They're not that short. <laughs> why do you own shorts why? that short? I, I didn't purchase them. My wife purchased them. Nice. You're going to just have to be distracted throughout the course of this episode. I hope you're okay with that. It's going to be hard to focus. I'll, I'll see what I can do. Excellent. Well, what's going on with you, man? Oh, what is going on? Oh, it's the 4th of July. I'm pretending to get through this work week without really doing any work, so that's pretty good. I like that. Yeah, other than that, not too much. What'd you do? Anything fun? Uh, we went to my partner's parents' country club oh, and s- nice. swam in the pool. You were the last person I'd expect at a country club, just knowing you, and I love the juxtaposition, how your partner like goes to the country club and you have to go there. It just seems very non-Luke Neitzel. Well, I enjoy the pool. Ooh, there you that's, go. Yeah. I've never golfed it or played tennis on it or anything like that, but I will sit in the pool and eat the food. Hey, I went. I sat by the pool and lost in poker, if I'm not mistaken. That is I true. Got, I got waxed pretty bad. Well, it was my day. I deserved to win. Yeah, was... Did you win then? Yeah. Oh, you're a jerk. You always win. I think I got like three full houses. I really had it going that day. Really? Mm-hmm. Well, I had it going yesterday. We went to the Brewers game. Now, I'm not a Brewers fan, but my dad is, and my dad had never been to uh, Miller Park before yesterday, so it was a oh. big day for him. Uh, we got tickets, and it was a lot of fun to see both Grandpa Madrid and Boom Madrid talk a lot of crap, because Boom, my daughter, is a huge Cubs fan, and obviously there's that rivalry there, and it was just really fun to get him, to get, to take him and get to see that. Um, and Good it was day her, for it, too. Yeah, it was, well, it was, it was pretty roasty toasty. Um, it was also Boom's first baseball game that she'll remember. She went to a Boom oh. game before when she was just a baby, and so it was kind of cool, him going and her going, and then... Um, it was the Brewers against the Twins, and my first ever baseball game was Brewers against the Twins. So uh, very cool, kind of very symmetrical in that. So and that's funny because I went the day before with my family. You did yeah, and both were Brewer victories, much to my chagrin. Yeah, and I I'm a Twins fan, but I'm I enjoy the Brewers. That's the one team here that I can get into and talk to people about. So I I'm more on the side of if all things are equal, I definitely go Twins. But with the Twins being what Ten games under five hundred. Yeah. I'm fine with the the Brewers winning all that. And my my kids are growing up here, so they're Brewers fans. So no. my, my son got a fall ball. Did he really? Not actually a fall ball. Uh, Keon Braxton was coming back and threw the ball to him, and it he missed it. It hit his ankle, went off his sister's forehead, Ooh. and then rolled down to some other guys who then gave him back the That's ball. That's awesome. So. That's awesome. Um, I really so like, for me, it was I the like first Brock two, because it was my first time in the Miller Park uh, mini hospital <laughs> that oh. they have. She's fine. <laughs> but they make you go there. I guess that makes sense. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, before we get started with uh, the news, let's. well, I guess we should intro the news. There's a there's a drop for that, so let's do that. Yeah, it worked, worked hard making it. I know. I least you can do is pause so I can put it, it in. Dis- disrespectful. All right. One, two, three, pause. One, two, three, pause. One. All right, before we get started here, uh, there's a mild spoiler alert that I want to warn everyone about before we continue. If you're saving yourself for that special someone or for spoiler purity, please fast forward this segment about 10 minutes. Uh, what follows may or may not be a, be a spoiler for episode 9. So I just. I'll timestamp it. I don't think it's a big deal, but I want everybody to know. So, multiple uh, sources, including io9. Is that what it is? I always say io9. I hope that's right. Sure. All right. Um, they're reporting that Billy D. Williams has had to pull out of a publicity appearance at the Saskatchewan Entertainment... I'm not making this up. The Saskatchewan Entertainment Expo due to a filming conflict that just popped up. So given that Billy D.'s schedule has been particularly sparse as of late, 
and that no one is saying anything rampant speculation has been that he is going to make at least a cameo appearance in episode 9. Luke, we've gotten stories about Han, Luke, and Leia. Are you looking forward to having Lando make an appearance in the episodic films, or are you disappointed that this series is going yet to another callback as it seems just ready to break off and something start something entirely new? No, I'm excited for it. I don't I don't think that moving in a new direction means you can you scrap everything that came before it. I just what what I don't want is Lando to be them to go visit Lando because he's running some type of thing he scammed his way into and then he betrays them to the Empire. <laughs> oh, you know, like if they do that, I'll be very disappointed. But I'd like to know where he is and what he's doing. He's the biggest presence that hasn't been in the new trilogy, so I'm I'm all for finding and the hero out what of the Battle of Endor. Well, yeah, you know, he's, he's a big deal. Yeah, and the Battle of Snab. He did That's that maneuver. True. It was a big deal. I think he made that shit up. <laughs> Someone heard about it. <laughs> So no, I, I'd be excited for him to be in it. I was surprised he wasn't in it, but I guess in hindsight, if he'd been in Last Jedi, he probably would have blown up in the first <laughs> twenty minutes. So, so we'll see where he uh, we'll see where he ends up. But I'm good with it. Well, I wrote this and immediately realized that a universe with three PO, R two D two, Chewbacca, and the Millennium Falcon, particularly with Ben Solo, probably is never going to completely break away and you know from from the old stuff. And maybe it doesn't have to. That being said, I'm still a bit apprehensive. What we heard was that Episode 7 was going to have a big part for Han, and it did. And then Last Jedi was Luke's film, and it was. And then Episode 9 was supposed to be about Leia, which obviously isn't going to happen with Carrie Fisher passing away. So it seems like Billy Dee Williams is sort of like a consolation prize. Like, they weren't going to have him, but since Carrie Fisher... Yeah, um, passed away. We're just gonna bring in Lando. Well, um, you're you're inferring though that he's going to be a major plot point. The, the, yeah, because we have I no am. idea. His role could be a cameo, and he has to leave because he has two total days of shooting, or he could end up being a major factor. I I think it would be really hard narratively at this point to bring him in and make him a mass focal point of this story, since he hasn't even been mentioned in this trilogy. So I don't, I, my guess is that's not where they're going. I, I think he'll be in it, but I don't think it's going to, I don't think he's going to be filling the role that they had envisioned for I have, Leia. I have two responses. First, I'd say I'm apprehensive. I'm worried that this could be the route that it would, that it would go. And the second thing I would say is I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think you had to mention. We didn't know about Admiral Holdo. We didn't know about Rose Tico, but those are two absolutely integral parts of that story, of that story. So I think definitely he could pass up. Now, um, story-wise, though, I feel like... But they weren't filling the Luke Skywalker, Han Solo roles of those movies. They're supporting characters. Sure, but we didn't know about Ray beforehand. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can introduce somebody into a movie and still have them be a big deal. Yeah, no, I mean, there's certainly ways to do it, but it would seem odd taking a character that's really known and popular. I guess that's my Not opinion. talking about him for two movies and then and bringing then him sudden, back. Right. Uh, especially because, you know, it's not like he's... He's, you know, Thor that's going to land out there all super-powered and able to do everything well, to, to save the day. I, depending I, how much fan service J.J. Abrams wants to do. That is true. It is, like... it is J.J. Abrams, so, it, it, you know, maybe he's leaning more fan service. But um, I, I'm going to guess he is not filling the, the Leia role. Right. Well, I, and I think we kind of missed the boat a little bit. In The Force Awakens, it would have been a perfect role to have him instead of Maz Kanata. In The Last Jedi, he could have filled a role at Canto Bight or just been at Canto Bight. It would have been, like, the perfect thing. So it feels like we had two opportunities to do it, and then I'm just worried that this is going to be a little bit awkward. Yeah, yeah, we'll just have to see how they do it. Yeah. As, I, as with anything, if they write a good story, we're not going to Yeah, and I, I like Billy Dee Williams. Yeah. I like Lando the character. So right. he's awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm more excited than if they were telling me that they were going to have Bubba Fett in this movie yeah. or, you know... So, someone like that that I don't need, you know, Jar Jar, or whatever. Oh, we'll get to him later. I'm sadly sure. So, it's time for the segment where Luke uses his First Amendment rights to talk about his feelings about the Star Wars news from over the course of the week and gets immediate positive or negative feedback for the fun of it. We keep score. The segment is Am I Right or Am I Wrong? Last week, Luke, you were a big winner with five correct answers. Let's see, <laughs> let's see if you can start your mini streak. By making it two weeks in a row. Luke Neitzel, are you ready to go? I am ready. All right. This week, Ahmad Best, best known for his role and voice of Jar Jar Binks, admitted that the negativity surrounding his appearance in the prequels led him to consider suicide. 
Luke, out of all these tragic stories about people involved with this series being destroyed by the fans of these movies, which do you think is the most tragic? Huh. I mean, that that is horrible. I mean, I, I feel like this is... I don't really particularly like this question. Well, I'm uh, you know, because I'm, I'm ranking people's misery, you know. Is it, what, is what it worse than Ahmed? Ba- I, well, I, what's hit you the hardest, I should say? Okay, if you like that better. What? Okay, what what hit me the hardest was, because I had to visit... Phys- because I physically saw it, is people using racial slurs and things towards Kelly Marie Tran. I, I 100% believe Ahmed Best went through all those things, and I don't want to belittle any of his pain right. that he went through, but it's all new to me, and I didn't have to see the actual, this is what specifically people are saying to me that is horrific and terrible. Um, and, you know, I don't know if, I don't think Jake Lloyd said anything about suicide, but we know that he considers Star Wars to have ruined his life. Um so there, there are certainly a few different horrible stories you could take out of there, but I'll, I'll at this point take the Kelly Marie Tran thing because that's where I actually had to, I actually sat and saw what people were saying. Very good. I'll give you the point for that. I feel weird giving out points, but it was one of the news, and that's the way we do yeah. the segment. Uh, the other best answer I would take is George Lucas himself because nobody is more identified with this entirety of, and I grant, grant the guy got a $4 billion check. But at the same time, like he has put everything in his life to the, into this, and it's totally turned foul. And at the end, when he sold it, he hated Star Wars and hated everything that he had created. So that that kind of hit me the hardest. Yeah, I'm sad about that. Yeah, I, I feel worse for like I'm at best because at least George Lucas is remembered for the first ones that everyone is beloved, and he also, like you said, got the significantly bigger paycheck and and all those things that come with it as well. Where this is all I'm at best is known for right. is this, and this is probably all he'll ever be known for and he's known as the most reviled character in the whole thing at this stage at least and probably always will be and so that i i feel bad for him on that aspect but i mean the 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 whole thing just comes back to the overall topic of anonymous people tearing down things and being horrible and cruel and thinking they have ownership of things they don't have ownership of and how sad it is that we not me specifically, but that people have to endure that. Yeah, it's it's getting worse, and it gets worse by the week. It seems like there's no end in sight. Uh, so you get the point for that. Uh, question number two. Permits have begun to be filed for the new Star Wars hotel down in Florida, where the creators promise an immersive experience unlike any other. For the point, Luke, what is one thing a Star Wars hotel must give you in order for it to meet your extremely high expectations uh a button where i dump my mother-in-law into like a rancor pit i'm gonna give you the point for that that's not what we had but i had i would have taken uh good pillows or a screen that lets you put the room into hyperdrive oh Uh, that would be amazing i I like your answer just as much um that was uh i did not expect that that was good all right so up to nothing early lead early lead here and we go to question number three luke Poe Dameron's comic run is coming to an end. Every so often you go into comic book stores, mostly to patronize your kids. Today. Did you really? Yeah. What'd you get? Um, oh man, it was so much deliberation. So my son went away, he, well he went and got a Black Panther right away, because he loves that movie, that's his new thing. Yeah. And then he, deli- he, he had an Aquaman, and he put Aquaman back and uh, got a Spider-Man. Comics. Respect. Yeah. Everything about that, respect. And my, my daughter got um, a Wonder Woman right away, and then she was going to get Supergirl, but she thought the cover looked too scary, because <laughs> the Superwoman was getting choked out in the okay, cover. Yeah. Um, so then she ended up going with My Little Pony, which is n- no problems there, except for the fact that there are like 15 different My Little Ponies, so having to watch her pick which My Little oh, Pony man. she was going to take was a process. Yeah, there are a lot of different ones. Boom has been into that, too, where she'll have to look at all oh, the my different gosh. ones. And... Yeah. Um, so, for the point, give your fans one character who would entice you to purchase a comic book uh, from what store. Oh, man. They were the star. It had to be... They can't just cameo. Like, it, it's their comic Okay, it's definitely not DJ. Okay, yeah, I can, I can tell you that much right now. I was go- I was just about to like do his little stutter thing, and say what, and then I realized that's the stupidest thing ever, and so I held off on. I just wanted you to know the filter that I have. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, head. I'm gonna surprise you, and now I'm feeling bad because I can't remember the name, but I want the the woman in Solo that ends Zero. up. No. Um, oh, Emphis Ness. Emphis Ness. Yeah. I would want an Emphis Ness one, because there is a lot of area to play with there, 
and that was one of the highlights for me was that character, and I would love to see more of that. Luke, I, your, it's a good answer, and I'm going to give you the point. You're not exactly right, okay. but you're pretty right. Um, I would have taken multiple answers here. You know, Emphasis is a good one, but the best answer, Paige Tico. Oh, Rose's yeah. sister. You look at her death and how awesome that was done in The Last Jedi to get more back filler, which is what a lot of these comic books do, and to get really enriching stories. I would have liked to see uh, more of her story. Yeah, so. which would grow Rose as a character too, yeah. I imagine. All right, so you're up 3 nothing. I feel like you haven't hit the ball hard. We've gotten three you know, singles. Yeah, you know, we bunt for singles if we need to. You yeah, know, it's, so. it's about getting on base. That's right. So you get one more and you get the win. Are we going to finish out? Oh, my. If, if you get one more? No, well, we got to go through them. we gotta, oh. <laughs> we got time to fill. <laughs> hey, Luke. Uh, Christopher McQuarrie announced on Twitter that his interest in directing a Star Wars movie has dissipated with all of the online drama dished out by trolls. Luke, Luke is this a bad thing for the Star Wars universe? Losing McQuarrie specifically. Yes. I don't think it's a horrible thing. I don't have anything against him, but he plays into that very safe zone of where we're already seeing them pick. And what we've kind of harped on uh, harped on a bunch is how little diversity they are, and this is another safe white male choice. So let's let's strive beyond that. Let's fill that diversity we've talked about. Let's let's go for something different. So I'm I'm not losing sleep over Christopher McQuarrie finding something else. And also I think he'll do just fine on his own property anyway, so I'd be excited for that. Sure. So you get the point. Congratulations. You get Woo! the win today. 4-0, and oh, just coming out of the box. Uh, at first glance, I would say that it's a bad thing. A director saying, oh, you know, I don't want to be part of a Star Wars uh, series. And we obviously want talented directors to be interested in this universe, and we want them to make interesting films. At second look, however, one must realize that 75% of his films, at least as a director, have involved Tom Cruise. Signal, signaling that in some weird twist of events, the Star Wars universe may have dodged a bullet here. Yeah, we don't we don't need that. We don't need that. We're good. Yeah. We're good. All right, should we play the rest? The last yeah, we got to finish fun? it up. All right. Number five, J.J. Abrams started off the new trilogy with a crack on the prequels, and the line was from The Force Awakens was, this will go a long way into making things right again. Recently, however, he has hinted he wants to link the new trilogy back to the prequels, Perhaps by including one of the planets from the original trilogy. Luke, make a prediction. What planet is it going to be? Well, this would, well, they already did Mustafar. So I don't think it'll be that one. Um, so then... I wouldn't mind seeing... I suppose the prediction with the Naboo would be the one I think it is. But it would be easier... It would be more fun to see like Utapau or, or Kashyyyk, I suppose. But I don't really count that as a prequel planet. Um, so I'll, I'll say that it, Naboo is the answer, but Utapau is what I'd probably rather see. Luke, I'm so sorry. You, you did really close on that. N Naboo would be the best. That would be awesome. And I think your answer of uh, Utapau would be really good. Uh, Tatooine would be the worst. I don't want to go back there. Yeah, again. and that's not a prequel plan. Right. But Kylo Ren on Mustafar is the one that needs to happen. And that's where the climax of the, of the final film between him and Ray. So, yes, you were on the right track, um, but unfortunately, you hit the ball hard there, but it was Dead. right at somebody. Cam Braxton so. was guarding the wall. <laughs> he's really good. Yeah. Wish he was not he, on the Brewers. He's, well, don't worry. He won't be for long because he's fifth in outfield depth. So Is, Oh, yeah. Cause they, yeah. All right, number six. Luke, are you ready? Yep. You are four to one. Four out of five. Here's question six. Luke, President Trump has directed the Department of Defense to create a space force in order to make Star Wars a reality like Reagan before him. Which Star Wars character would you tap to lead this bold new adventure into space? I pass. <laughs> Not one, a robot. You're incorrect. <laughs> now look, the, the obvious answer here is Leia. But there's no way she would he's do gonna, it. Yeah, he's going to pick a right. woman. Right. Well, yeah. and she wouldn't do it because Alderaan is a peaceful planet. They yeah. have no weapons. Uh, there's no way she would defend this planet. Instead, the fittingest character is Moff Tarkin. That is the person that he would, he would yeah. tap. For. Too bad Betsy DeVos will be up there protecting us from grizzly she bears in space. So. <laughs> hey, uh, the last question. So you're four, four for six here. Uh, still pretty good average. Um, Geek.com. Ran an article on the style of Star Wars. Luke, who is the most styly person in the entire galaxy far, far away? Lando. 
So close. No, no I'm you're sorry. So close. I'm, sorry. I'm no, correct. You're not correct. It's Amidala. It's Padme. No, it's Amidala Lando. Carter. It's not Lando. It's Amidala. You saw Shirley. his cape room. <laughs> I did see his cape room. It's Go back Lando. and watch Phantom Manus. I know you don't like the movie. It's Amidala. So, four much, to three. Much like good. your lightsabers last year, we picked the white option. <sighs> you picked the male option like you always do. <laughs> So, uh, congratulations to Luke for being victorious, stretching his win streak to two, which is a record, by the yeah, way. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Going it's, four for seven. Yeah. It's a great effort out there today. I'm sure all our fans are really impressed. Let's get to emails the kids seriously got. Hey guys, if you're out there and you want to contact the show, we'd love to hear what you have to say. We can be reached at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com, or you can send us a message either at kidsseriously at Luke underscore Neitzel, or at Miami Madrid, and fire off a question for everyone's favorite segment, emails that kids seriously got. And by the way, it doesn't have to be an email. Luke, Jed from Florida asks, why the Toronto Maple Leafs are so bad all the time, despite having such a great fan base? They tend to buy, like, whatever's hot and trendy. Like, they just throw money at a problem, and they spend forever not developing a system, just trying to to get whatever they could get instead of assembling an actual team. But they have been building the right way now for a little bit, and we're starting to see that. Is that a sort of like Real Madrid, uh, New York Mets, New York Knicks sort of thing where you're the biggest town in the, or the biggest team in the biggest city and you're just trying to get stars? Like, is it chasing yeah, and I Yeah, and I, you know, it, it, it's the biggest fandom. It's the craziest fandom. It's the most intense fandom. So it's it's a you have to win. They they don't they don't accept years of being bad as oh well they're developing a system and implementing players and and all those things. So then they just try to grab all these free agents and overspend and and whatnot, and then they end up they end up having years of just being awful because of it. So they allowed themselves to be bad for a while, and have built and developed a really really amazing group of prospects and then you throw that in there with you know they they signed john tavares but they have a plan with john tavares and john tavares is one of the best players in the league he's on the islanders right yeah so yeah i mean they're they're i mean that's their and he's going to be their second center behind austin matthews which is going to ask is is awesome yeah what yeah i mean anyone can be moved or whatever but like you know whatever their their first and second line is going to be interchangeable first or second line and name i mean either of those lines would be first line on pretty much any other team so you know you throw that in there with Marner and Nylander and all these other things there is uh still a lot of worrying about that defense but they have so much offense in their pipe that they they can trade now they're they're the cap is what's going to hurt them altogether but you know they're a team that could go in there and win a lot of games high scoring um I personally think Frederick Anderson is an above average goalie who will steal them a few games so I think they're they're in the right path, and I think the moves that they made this year make sense. Tavares took less money to go there because he's from Toronto. It's his well, dream. You, you sent me that picture that had the Nabu Starfighter along with him. Yeah. That was him in, in that bed, right? Like, I didn't even yep. know. Okay. Yep, 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 yeah. It was a picture of him that he tweeted after signing with the Maple Leafs of him sleeping in Maple Leaf sheets saying, you know, it's not every day you get to live your childhood dream to explain kind of why he shunned the Islanders or turned down more money from, you know, San Jose and Dallas and Boston and these other teams that that went to woo him. So, um, you know, I, I think they're building the right way now, but, you know, they've they've been the model of what not to do for so long before then that they are too kind of one of those teams where it's like, okay, you've made the playoffs a few years. Obviously, everyone likes Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews, but – you're going to have to really show it. I mean, they have the best coach in the league, too, which can't be underrated in Babcock. So uh, it's it's an exciting time. Now, they're not my team, but uh, my kids are getting older, but they like to watch hockey, and we have the NHL package, and they can't stay up late enough to watch the Wild most of the time, or if they do, they can watch, like, just part of a period. So we watch a lot of the East Coast teams because their games start, you know, at 6 o'clock, and the Maple Leafs were the team that my son picked. So we started watching the Maple Leafs together, so that's kind of become my default second team just because that's the the team we always watch. So it's a good time for me to be coming on board and be able to to do it. So we'll see what they do. I mean, it's 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 certainly not a sure thing. It, the, the NHL is more varied than, you know, say the NBA, 
where it's kind of you go into a season and there's a couple teams that you think legitimately have a shot. There's a lot more teams in the NHL that have a shot, and you have teams like Vegas that no one in their right mind ever would have picked making a Stanley Cup final, and they almost won the President's Trophy. So um, it, it it'll be an exciting year. It'll be a, it'll be fun. That's for sure. Well, your answer has elicited another question in my mind that I'd like to ask here late, if I can ask yeah, a yeah. question on kids. In emails that kids seriously you got. said they didn't have to be emails so yeah have to be emails would you prefer a salary structure similar to the nba which there is a soft cap and a hard cap the soft cap is what you can't go over to sign free agents but if you get in-house players to go above the cap towards the hard cap would you, you know, so that you can keep homegrown guys? Sure. Is that something that you would prefer to see in the NHL? Or it sounds like they have a hard cap like the NFL does. Yeah, they have a hard cap like okay. the NFL. And guaranteed contracts, so you can't just cut everyone right. when you want out of it. You know, that that would be, that would be nice because it's a reward for teams that draft properly. And then you would have some guys who, who stay around. Um, you know, m- my team, the Wild, is a team that spends a lot. So that would benefit them, but they haven't drafted particularly well, so who knows how it would work out. And we have benefited from and continue to benefit from Minnesota being the biggest producer of American-born players and a lot of them wanting to come to Minnesota to play when they get in their career. So it could actually negatively impact my team a little bit because they rely heavily on bringing Minnesotans back. Um, But I, I like the idea in general of rewarding teams that draft well and making a pathway for them to kind of retain some of that. But the only reason I ask is I think about teams like you know Calgary, teams like uh, Winnipeg that, that come from smaller Canadian markets that might have trouble. That's a way that you know NBA teams like the Thunder. We saw you know Paul George, the guy that I really wanted, and Russell Westbrook both are able to to go over the cap. Um, for them to keep those guys in those small markets. And so even though, um, you know, they're allowed to offer more money, I guess is, is what I'm saying. And so that benefits some small market teams that don't necessarily have a chance. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it's not it's not like baseball. So, you know, they have a hard cap, so it is what it is. And, you know, Calgary, maybe not Calgary, but like Winnipeg spends to the cap, you know, because mm-hmm. they've drafted so well and you have to re-up all these players. They're right up against the cap spending as much as the Maple Leafs. True. So, um, it, 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 the way they have it set up doesn't punish those teams, but I think it would be nice to reward teams that draft well. Do they do a lot of re- revenue sharing in the NHL, similar to yeah. the other leagues? Yep, and that's how the cap is determined every year, okay. based on how much, you know, overall, you know, percentages and revenue that's brought in, and then they readjust the cap each year on that, because the players' salaries gets to be a certain percentage of revenue, so it can go up or down, but I think since they put that in place, I think it went down once, other than that, it's always gone up. Well, let me tell you about getting things that are going about to go down. Our review of the Coyote <laughs> series is about to go down. Smooth. It got it got dirty there in my mind for a second, so I was like, uh, uh. Billy D. Williams would have thrown you a Colt forty five for how smooth that transition was. Let's talk about the Clone Wars, season one, episode twenty one, Liberty on Ryloth. Compromise is a virtue to be cultivated, not a weakness to be sp- despised. Not that important in the episode. No, not really. It doesn't have to be. <laughs> Never is. <laughs> in the penultimate episode of season one, written by Henry Gilroy and directed by Rob Coleman... Liberty on Ryloth is the big payoff of the tw- the Twi'lek. I keep saying Twi'lek. It's Twi'lek trilogy. Will the Republic, led by Mace Windu, and the Twi'leks be able to work together to rid the planet of separatist control? What say you, Luke Neitzel? So this is part three. We already know Anakin is in space taking care of any starships that might be coming in and flying around in his little cruiser blowing stuff up. And Obi-Wan has won the whole southern hemisphere of this planet. So He's really awesome. Good on him. But the whole thing relies on uh, Mace Windu taking over the capital city of Lasu, which is basically a plateau in the middle of a canyon of... Not to mention a really hard place to get through. When they're when they're starting off, they've got about like I don't know about 
10 yards of space with those like little walkers trying to get up there i was like there's got to be a better way to do this yeah it's a very drop those dudes off somewhere else it is a strategic place to put your capital because there is not easy ways to attack it and the only way you can get to it is as you mentioned going through this very narrow canyon pass or mountain pass and then there is um a, a brit and a you know a man-made i forget what they call it uh like, like bridge? particle bridge yeah basically a cross of it so they can flip it on and off with a switch and that's the only way into the city which is actually kind of ridiculous when you think about the world they're living in but uh anyway we open up in a battle sequence where the kind of smaller versions of walkers that are introduced in the prequels are making their way those are in the prequels i was gonna ask about those being new do you remember so i can go and watch them attack of the clones when you get to the end battle and they bring in all the military they actually uh they actually have because i like that battle sequence they they fly them in they're like attached to troop ships and they fly them in and just drop them and they just immediately start going how did i miss that i've seen that movie quite a bit Quite a few times. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Go to the, go to the end when the the clone army arrives. They're in there. So they are. Mace Windu is leading a battalion of those, but it's a very narrow path. They can only go one at a time, and they're getting bombarded by battle droids with tanks that are fighting at them. Decent sequence. They end up having one get blown up that blocks their path, and Mace Windu uses the force to just break glass and pull guys out, and then force push a a tank off a cliff, and. They then call on the Lightning Squadron, which I really liked, which is mini, mini walkers. Like, one person. Those the, are the ones. walkers I was talking about. Oh, no, no. I'm talking about the bigger tank ones. Okay, the, the mini, mini ones. Mini the mini ones are not. Ones are okay. Yeah, the Lightning Squads aren't, which they jump on and they move really fast because the other walkers are very, very slow. Yeah, they're like baby AT-AT walkers, except with, like, the little top part that we saw in Return of the Jedi where Chewbacca and the Ewoks. Yeah. Are. There's just, like, one dude with, like, a joystick. Uh, it seemed like a really bad design for me. Like, one shot with no protection and then millions of dollars worth of, like, equipment is out the door. What about an Imperial Locker is a good design? Uh, <laughs> you think yeah. about it. But it looks Fair cool. Point. It does and, look and cool. And they zipped really fast. So they take off on those. Wet, uh, Wat Tambor, who has been kind you of... You know what would be better than those chicken, those baby, baby chicken walkers? Hmm. Like a speeder? Yeah, you like would think. Speeder, but, like just or just using things. the force. Oh, but <laughs> either, <you're> remarkable. <laughs> either way, Wat Tambor is in the city. He's been the lead villain of this whole three-story arc, but he's been in the shadows until now. So he is in this city along with a, another droid commander, and they basically know they're losing the city, but he's kind of stubbornly refusing to give up the planet. How many of those droid commanders have we seen now? Because literally we Six. saw... Okay, so they're just like manufactured. They're just brand new. I thought that first one was like... I droid like that was like a recurring character and then i realized in this episode wait we just saw that dude get his guts ripped out by they've been they've been blown up in a few different ones so yeah i'm assuming they must have just made a class of droid that's actually programmed to have battle tactics in it so that it can lead forces yeah Yeah. they aren't jokey which is nice because the regular battle droids got a little little extra joke back to being a little extra jokey in this episode they also do look like they belong in mystery science or mystery science crow's robot yeah yeah like is yes, it like they do. homage or is it's it a, what's the deal? A bowling pin and a catcher's mask. Yeah, turn it, yeah. it's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's yeah. Well, we won't debate whether it's an homage or, okay. or stealing okay. right now, but uh, they <laughs> they they go there and um, they they realize that they're not going to be able to get into uh, the city on their own. So what they're going to have to do is go find our freedom fighter and wild card, who, Che Guevara. Yeah, exactly. Um. <laughs> Who is what? What's his name? Uh, Sham Sindula, who is a Twi'lek, who is living on the planet. And uh, Mace decides to go out and try and find him, thinking he needs him to help him get across the, the plasma bridge because they don't know how else they can they can get a, get across. Which, again, is really ridiculous because they could just fly across it or they could use the force and pull themselves across it or whatever. But it's what the story needs, so we'll, we'll let that go. Now, Dooku has ordered all of Ryloth destroyed. Because he knows they're about to lose the battle, and what he has decided is that he would, can score political points with the other systems if they can see that the cost of a Republic win in the system is just total devastation of a, a planet. I, real quick, I want to go back, right, so I'm, and I'm sorry to do that. I want to talk about our guy Cham here. And I want to talk about each week we have the discussion about race in Star Wars. Now... With Kit Fisto, you remember way back with Kit Fisto, who was very clearly sort of like a, a 
Caribbean or maybe an African accent with the with the tentacles that look like dreadlocks and very Jamaican was right. my yeah. yeah okay so we were okay with that because it wasn't it was an accent but it wasn't like it wasn't like when we saw the Trade Federation mockery of of Japanese people. yeah. How did you feel about Cham here? It was very clearly, I thought, like, this dude is Che Guevara. This is, like, a South American revolutionary with down-to-the-accent, like, everything about him. I'm okay with it because the the Twi'leks themselves didn't all have that specific stereotype. They all had different accents. They weren't all one race that they were trying to emulate, and the character didn't have exaggerated characteristics that are meant to embody that race either which is where a lot more of my problems with what they do comes in. So for this, I was just fine. You know, I, I think you're right. They were kind of going for that. But my other thought was maybe they just hired a Spanish actor, which is some of the things we've been talking about, you know, a Spanish-speaking right. actor, which is some of the things that we've been talking about we want them to do. Right. Um, so so I was not bothered by that. And, and I wasn't either, but this is the reason I wanted to bring it up, because I, I, I'm trying to figure out where my line is, because it's very clear in my head when I see it on the screen when I'm, like, disgusted by it. Or when I'm okay with it. Kid Fisto I bring up because I was okay with Kid Fisto. Just as I am with the Cham character. And I think it's... Like, accents don't bother me. I want more, you know, diversity in the in the show and in this universe. Um, diversity of aliens doesn't bother me. I think there should be more aliens and more stories about aliens. What bothers me is when people are mocked or stereotypes are introduced. Yeah. Or, um, you know, buttressed by stereotypes uh, in, in our world. And so... I, you know, I'm trying to figure out why I was fine with this and why I wasn't, and that's what came to mind for me. But I liked him. I thought he was a cool character. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I wasn't bothered by it either. So they, they go... Yeah, the Twi'lek strip show dancing thing, that was an interesting choice, though. Yeah, there are some adult themes in this episode, more so than in other ones. So Mace goes and, and finds Sendula, thinking he'll want to jump on board and help, but he doesn't really want to, and he sums it up relatively well in not necessarily seeing a huge difference between the Separatists or the Republic. And he asked Mace directly, you know, once you get these guys out of here, is your army going to stay here? And Mace is like, yeah, they'll, they'll stay here as, you know, peacekeepers for a while. And he kind of says, oh, well, okay, so eventually I'll just be fighting you. You know, what's, what's the difference? Like we're a free nation or a free planet and we want to remain a free planet, not a Republic planet. Which I thought was was good. It's great foreshadowing because that's actually what happens over the course of you know when the empire, yeah. when the emperor takes control and takes over. It also was kind of made me feel weird because that is basically the point of Afghanistan and Al Qaeda, which they began fighting the USSR and then eventually they fought the USA. And then yep. when you talk to or read about people who were doing that fight, they didn't really care. They said, "What's the difference?" And so I was kind of like, "Well, I like this character, but I don't like Al Qaeda." So. No, but I there's lessons to be learned from right. that, you know, and, and there there's something to be said about if you're a Mace Windu and you're that Republic, then you need to take heed of what you're actually doing in these places when you take it over and be respectful of who those people are and what they're they're trying to accomplish so that you leave yourself in the best position to not be creating an enemy. And I think a bigger, well, I, I, the example that jumped more out to me and we've seen, we've made a lot of Iraq War comparisons right. in here, but we invaded Iraq and we toppled the place and we didn't really have a plan for how the country would exist afterwards. And one of, in my opinion, the worst things we did was we abolished their military, which meant we weren't paying any of those people that were in the military and we destroyed their economy by doing that and we just thought they'd go, hooray, freedom, whatever. Yeah. And then they started turning over time, they start turning, you know, to fanatical organizations that will give them food and will employ them and then talk about how terrible what's happening to them is and give them sympathy and that is a, a lot of ways how wars are won and lost so that was what jumped out at, at me about it and i like it because i like i like this whole episode but i like that this this episode felt like a war episode yeah. more so than any other episode from how the battle sequences are done and filmed they feel they felt more like realistic war sequences the morals of what they were talking about was talking about war in general and less fantastical than I think we're used to in this series. I think this is by far the most adult episode that we have gotten so far. And I think rookies would be number two then. I think I think rookies would be number two, but I think this was more in, and we'll get to Layer of Grievous was up there too. Yeah. <laughs> do, do all the droids. Um but what we'll get to you know, we'll get to some other stuff that happens in there that's very, very adult that happens, but 
um, you know, he's reluctant, and then and then it steers a little bit into politics where Chom doesn't want to go with the Republic because the their senator in the Republic, who's Senator Ta, they don't the two of them hate each other and don't agree on what should happen to the planet and who should be in control, and they don't trust each other. Um, and and meanwhile, our bad guy is getting red. Watt is getting ready to extract the plan that Dooku has set out for him, where they send a bunch of bomber droids out, and we think they're going to go bomb some clones that are by a village, and instead they just destroy a village full of women and children and kill them all. And uh, that and that's what I'm referring to when suddenly it got a lot more adult than I was envisioning it being. Because you see this whole village, I mean, you don't see bodies, and you don't hear people screaming, but you know what's in that village, and you see that whole village burned to a crisp. What happens in war, and you hear air raid sirens in this this movie, or in this episode, which we haven't heard before, too, and all those to warn. So, it's a, it, they, you can tell to me that this is, we've seen kind of cutesy callbacks to, to Vietnam and things like that, and by, you know, cutesy, I mean, you know, rebel radio, and painting women on the nose of your airplane, and things of that nature, where this felt to me like you're drawing direct parallels to us. Napalming villages in Vietnam and, mm-hmm. and those. So it it was a lot more mature what was, was happening in that episode, or in this episode. I completely missed that. On my rankings, I ranked this much lower, and I just it just went over my head. Oh, really? Uh, you know, I was outside a lot in 95-degree weather yesterday. Sure. I was very dehydrated, so I'm going to use that as an excuse. But that bumps this up a little bit. I didn't even stop to think and uh I, I wish i would have gotten that my, my first time through watching this episode yeah so i i personally for me i, I took a, a lot out of this and what it builds to is that sindulu and the senator ta they agree on a path forward and they join up with mace windu and they go attack the bridge and we kind of have a thrilling action sequence there's where... a great shot of mace windu like holding the front of the speeder and it's got like shaky cam yeah and, and i don't generally like shaky cam but i thought this was excellently used now their plot to get across the plasma bridge is kind of nonsense because after all this thing about how it's impossible to get across the plasma bridge all they do is go in a personnel carrier and try to hide and then it doesn't work and then mace window uses the force yeah. and pulls a couple guys over <laughs> and then those guys run up and kill all the droids and turn the bridge on so it, it you know why didn't mace window just use the force but you know that's the kids' show element of it, I guess. And then a, a battle breaks out, and Watt is interesting as well because he's kind of defying Dooku with how, he's unwilling to give up that this that he's losing this planet and that his his things aren't going to proceed the way he laid him out. And Dooku keeps telling him to get out and just Dooku, leave. Dooku. Dooku. Oh, what did I say? Dooku. Yeah, <laughs> take your pick. And and, and the the droid co leader basically betrays him and steals the ship and is like, well. Fuck well, this. I'm getting out if you're going to stay here. So Watt is captured by Mace, and there's about to be uh, about to be a bunch of bombers that are going to come in and take all of them out in that main city, which was kind of their plan anyway, was to lure Mace Windu into this, because they know they can't ever beat Mace Windu. And then they were just going to bomb the city, but they were going to evacuate, but Watt was too stubborn to leave. So he's about to get bombed, and then Anakin just, like, shows up and blows everything up, which, if you had those fighters in the atmosphere, why weren't you just Doing the attacking the city time. and whatnot? But they Defending end up... Defending the village that just got burned to a crisp. Exactly. And then and then Ta and Sindulu, you know, pledge to put their faith in democracy, which we know that'll work out for everyone in the galaxy. Fairly certain. And we have one of the most Star Wars-y moments ever, because we end this episode with, like, everyone celebrating in the, the streets and having, like, a ceremony for the heroes. And uh, then we, we we fade to black. But I, I loved this episode. This is one of the better episodes for me. I, I loved how adult it was. I thought the action sequences were really exciting action sequences. I like how we just jumped right in. With that battle on the side of the mountain, I thought that was fun. I loved how badass Mace Windu was and how he used the Force in different ways than we've seen any other character use him, like shattering the glass. Um, it, it was you could tell from from very little that they showed him just how much more powerful a Jedi he is than any of the Jedi that we're normally used to dealing with. Mm-hmm. So th- this one, this one's real high for me. How many views you give it? Five. Five views. Yeah, it's up there in the top two, three. No, I. I rank it now probably at about five. Now, when I came in, it was at ten. Okay. My critique of this episode is that the things that you talked about and that really have got me to reconsider moving it up higher 
are things that are really interesting. It just was so short because there's so much battle sequence. Yeah, it's actiony. And, and I and I kind of I thought that took away from it. Originally, I had it ten. The the bit about the village really increases it. I I, I would have to look here. I think four. Four. No, I think three because I like it more than Innocence of Ryloth now. So I think it's up there for me too. Yeah, but this has been a fantastic arc. Yeah. For the most part, the first one isn't is kind of forgettable, but it's not bad. Yeah, it's and, not. It's average. Yeah, and these last two have been outstanding, and this is kind of what I want from the series as a whole is longer arcs. Like I'd be fine if they had full season arcs. Now you can detour from those arcs and have side stories and things that prop up, but I would have liked there to be some type of cohesion to what's actually happening where this was more kind of random stories and then you get a couple multiple episode right. arcs. Um, so they're, they're trying to find their footing and they're trying to get renewed and they're, yeah. Know, so, I mean, that, that kind of makes sense a little bit. That happens a lot with first seasons of shows and everything that I've heard from the people that have have seen the entire series, they seem to really like episodes two through the end of the series. Yeah, and there are going to be, I know for a fact, that there are more storylines that continue and progress over long periods of time that we're going to start, start getting. So um, if this is a, a flavor of good things that we have coming up, then I'm pretty satisfied. What are we going to do for the season finale next week. i don't know it's crazy so do we count that as the end of our season too not that we'd take a break or anything but we could we, we could say that would be our season, season one as well one is in the books yeah and season two would be yeah the next season i don't know we should do something yeah we need a kazoo a kazoo yeah i'll, I'll get on that right i, I don't know what a I, I don't know what a kazoo is yeah <laughs> isn't that the the martian guy and the flintstones no, it's the Martian guy in Martian Attacks. Oh, okay. Attacks. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so we only have one more to go. We do. That's crazy. I'm excited. Yeah, we'll see. I feel like a letdown's coming. <laughs> you know, right? It's like waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah, it's going to be know. a Jar Jar. Padme gets captured and only Jar Jar can see 3 po can save her. That's just, what it'll be. It's just Jar Jar walking through the streets <laughs> yes. of Tatooine. Just yes. like floppy ears. And, and Waddle all. will fly by and do something horribly racist. And <sighs> we'll, we'll call it a season. They just cut it ten minutes early. Yeah. <laughs> hey, let's get to other nerd news. What's got you going this week, Luke? I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. Oh, I've been watching Luke Cage. Luke Cage? Yeah. Season two. I love it. Really? It's really good. Like I've heard bad things. I, I'm not going to sit there and say it's like amazing television or whatever, but it's enjoyable and I'm not getting bored. And okay. I, I, I'm just having a good time with it. Like, it's it's definitely, it doesn't feel long, which most of these do. And, like, uh, did you watch the first season? I got through most of it, and then Defenders came out, and I watched that, and then I was kind of all okay. checked out. Because I loved the start of the first season, yeah. and then something dramatic happens, and then I think it got significantly worse, and very slow and boring through the end. And, you know, they, excuse me, in season one, they have multiple villains, but who actually emerges as the main villain, I had zero interest in to end that show. So I really was really excited for that at the get-go and then really struggled through the end of it. But this season, I'm, I think I finished, I finished eight. So I'm over halfway. And they have multiple villains as well, but I'm entertained by all of them. They're, they do some things a little different. I like that the story isn't really about someone's after Luke Cage. Like, it's more... People are fighting within Harlem, and he sees himself as the protector of Harlem, so he's inserting himself and trying to stop all that, as opposed to just, oh, some bad guy wants to come beat up Luke Cage, and they're going to punch each other a bunch of times. Right. I mean, there's a little bit of that, but it it, it feels like they, they thought about this a little bit more than I think they have in the past with some of these shows that they've put out from Marvel. It, it reminds me a little bit of Jessica Jones Season 2, which really doesn't even have a villain, because um, it's more just kind of about the characters, but this is more fun than that. Uh, I really like Mike Coulter as Luke Cage. Like I think he's great casting. Yeah, he's great casting. I I love Simone. I think it's Missick or Messick, who's Misty Knight. I mean, if the whole show was about Misty Knight, I'd be completely fine with that because I think she's great in this season. So it's it's been fun. I'm yeah. enjoying it. I hope it keeps up for the last five. So I know there's a special guest coming, so hopefully... Oh, well, it's your buddy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Except Everybody's buddy. But he he crossed... They, they did the right thing with him in The Defenders. 
Because the, one of the biggest problems I think in his in Iron Fist actual show is that he's the most ridiculous, asinine idiot of a character, but everyone treats him seriously. And then in the Defenders, nobody treated him right. seriously, and you're like, oh, thank God, this guy is worthless and dumb. So if it's just gonna be if he's gonna be in it for an episode and it's an hour of Luke Cage ripping on him, then I'm completely on board for that. <laughs> for me. Um... Disc golf. I picked up disc golf. I used to play a lot in Virginia. I used to play every day in um, Virginia. And then when I moved to Wisconsin about a decade ago, I kind of lost my way a little bit. And I was thinking, because I've had some extra time on my hands this summer, like what I could do for just to get out and enjoy the weather and stuff like that. And I was like, man, I should go disc golfing. So bought the discs, been out there the last four days, secure some of that, boor- that boredom. Um, even had Boom and Lady Madrid out there with me a couple of the times. And it's been a lot of fun. And so uh, the next person I'm going to get there is you, Mr. Luke Neitzel, and we will report back on our exploits. It's going to sure. go, go horribly, but it'll be fun either way. That's right. It'll, it's, I'm not very good. I, I recently learned, what, talking uh, uh, through text yesterday that there's more than one type of Frisbee. There is. So that was, that was something. There is. So. You're going to start with the putters because they're designed to go straight without being thrown very hard. Um, then they've got like mid ranges, and then the, the the drivers like you have to throw them extremely hard to get them to go straight. Okay, Which, but they go farther, obviously. They go farther, but you, yeah. th- like I can't get them to go straight right now. Okay. So, um, yeah, there's like a whole strategy. I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos nice. on it, like to try to like I actually start my drives with my back to the hole. Like I do this whole weird thing. I feel like I'm like a remember Mitch Williams, the reliever from like when we were kids. No, nope. like it's super weird. He was like a Philly, and he was a Cub, and they called him Wild Thing, you know, because we all saw that Major League movie, and we did. He had a really weird wind up. This isn't ringing a bell. He was a I wasn't. The well, you know, this was when we were growing up. Uh, you know, I was in American League town, and they never played each other. And if you weren't playing the Twins, I didn't really care. Wow. Well, I hope you guys cared about this episode <laughs> since we're gonna end it on just. Just giving up and just flailing out on Mitch Williams and uh, the sport of disc golf. It does not bother me. Luke, how can they contact you? The people, they want to speak to you. About Mitch Williams. Them. About Mitch Williams and other things. Yeah, uh, at Luke. And Lando's ca- cape closet. Oh, it's amazing. A whole room just for capes? Dude, I will take a whole palace filled with Amidala's Yeah, but, but, but. Dude, the dresses had little lanterns on it. Yeah, what but then the next about? princess is wearing them in the next few movies. So why aren't they the best dressed? It's know. just ceremonial garb for for a role. It's not even her wardrobe. Think about when it switches to her wardrobe, she wears white jumpsuits. Like, come on. Yeah, okay, now in retrospect, that yeah. we're old, we don't like that white jumpsuit. We think it's disrespectful. But I think when we were 22, we liked that white jumpsuit plenty. But you, you can't give her best dressed. You, it's got to be the styly. man with the cape. I said styly. I said so. Well, and see, now that's even worse, because, man, yeah. there is nothing stylish about anything she wears when she picks her own clothes. And that, that Garby stuff you like, you're seeing, you know, Keisha Castle Hughes wear in two other movies. So, uh, you know, she did it for longer, so she should be best dressed, apparently. You know, sometimes in a baseball game, since I went to the baseball game yesterday and you mm-hmm. went the day before, when the ump would realize that they were wrong, but it's, like, too late to give you go back and give you the point. Oh, that's that's just what it is. Like, hey, yeah. I made the call like I saw it at the time. Okay, so, that's know, the game. You know, that's the game. Speaking of that, actually, semi happened at, at the game we were at where a twin. It was it was a full count, and a tw- or uh, it, he, a twin was batting and he had two strikes, and he he took a pitch, and he started to walk back to the dugout, being like, "Oh man, that was definitely a strike," and the umpire did nothing. So he goes back to the mound and digs in, and then the umpire went, strike three! (laughs) (laughs) It was very bizarre, and the player lost his shit, and it was... It was towards the end, and Molitor almost got ejected. I think Molitor was close to getting ejected, but the game was... It was in the 8th or the ninth. so I think Molitor was like, fuck it, I just want to go back to the hotel and cheat on my wife, so I'm going to oh, go wow. get out of here. Wow, <laughs> chill pony, did you hear that? Oh! Lady Madrid's really good friend. Her husband is a huge Molitor fan, and I didn't have the heart to tell, at least tell me. Well, you know. Why do you, why you like Molitor so much? And he was like, oh, you know, he's just a... 
good character guy. <laughs> <laughs> always did the right thing, and I always looked up to him so much as a kid, and knowing what you've told me about Paul Molitor. You want to talk a little bit about Paul Molitor? Ah, uh, he had a wandering eye, and he likes to brag to low-level radio interns about his wandering eye. So. And you happen to be at that low-level <laughs> uh, radio interns. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. Where can they find you? Uh, how about at Maya Madrid? We better go before we... <laughs> before Paul <laughs> Molitor beats me down. <laughs> See ya! Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at kidsseriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.